Thank you very much. Uh, it is a thrill to be here, thanks to the committee and all the rest of the folks who were responsible for uh, some of the help that I got here. Again, it's a, a thrill to be here, and more importantly, it's a thrill to see you here, uh, that you got to come and spend an hour moving backward in time with me. Uh, I, I have taught writing classes in the English department now, headed by Professor Grasso, as well as writing intensive courses in the department where I am now, in the Performing and Fine Arts department. And uh, I have spent a lot of time reading student papers. And at certain points of great frustration in the middle of the semester, I have said to students that I am going to grade you based on the titles that I see on these papers. I'm not going to read the rest of the paper. If you haven't put together a great title for the paper, I am convinced that you probably haven't put much effort in the rest of the paper. But if I see a title that has captured my attention, that uh, makes me curious and want to read on a little further, then I'm going to be sure to look closely. Uh, whether this fits the bill or not, uh, uh, I have written that the title of this particular lecture is Will Write Later, Image, Technology, and Social History in Early 20th Century New England. And if I could just for a minute unpack this, it may be helpful to understand what it is that you're going to be watching over the course of the remainder of the time that we're together. I have two theories about titles, and you can nod your head in favor of either one of these. My sense is that sometimes titles function to allow you to summarize what it is that you've already done. In other words, it's something that you append to the top of the paper after you've written the whole thing out. And the purpose of the title in this particular case is to summarize what you've already done. But there's another theory about titles that argues that titles are the first thing that gets written in the paper, and you spend all of the rest of your time constructing a text that will reveal what it is that this title says. There's a little bit of both strategies at work in this particular title. I have spent a lot of time uh, discussing in the course of this lecture and in my own thinking long before I tackled this lecture and uh, long after I will finish this lecture, thinking about the relationship between image and technology and social history. These three cardinal terms that seem to represent dimensions of some of the problems that I've been interested in. And uh, I have also spent a lot of time looking at these postcards and reading the language that appears on the back of these cards. And this opening title, the primary title, Will Write Later, is one of those phrases that appeared in many of these cards. It is a shorthand version of, as you could guess, I will write you a letter later. But all the rest of those letters are skipped. As a consequence of being up against a very short space in which to fit your words, you had to construct new arrangements of words that would allow you to communicate your lesson, uh, your message. And in this particular case, my sense is we're looking at a precursor of some of the same things that you might have seen when trying to construct a Twitter message, for example, or some of the other using some of the other social media that also require very shorthand bursts of communication. This is an example of some of the kinds of technologies that I'm talking about. We don't often think of language as a technology, as a machine that somehow allows us to communicate or extend ourselves or do work for us any of which might be definitions of what machines do. But if those are, in fact, uh, words that describe what machines do, 
then we can think of a phrase we'll write later as an adaptation in the technologies of language to meet new purposes. This is, as I say, an instance in and of itself of the ways in which technology figured in this instance much of my thinking about what I was trying to do when putting together these slides that we'll have a chance to look at in just a moment. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to this group of folks over here who are all students in Professor Giesler's Introduction to Mass Communication or Mass Media, a course that uh, we have not been able to offer for a long time, and I'm glad after a long hiatus that they're here to participate in a conversation about a media that hasn't been given a lot of attention, a media that flowered a hundred years ago. And what I'm about to do now is to lay out some of the things that moved me when spending time thinking about these uh, ideas. And these things you usually see in print form in a bibliography or in footnotes. Now, in oral presentations, you don't often see that kind of stuff. Who would ever include in a lecture a bibliography at the end of the lecture? Not many folks, but I'm going to go one step further and include the bibliography right up front here. Uh, if I can quickly move to the next slide and offer uh, an example of one of those books that had a big impact on me in a genealogy of intellectual origins for much of the things that I was talking about. A book about an area of the country located in the states of Massachusetts and Rhode Island, a river called the Blackstone that flows between Worcester, Massachusetts and uh, eventually out to the sea through the Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. Another uh, book that I was very interested in this project, a reference work titled Views and Viewmakers of Urban America, Lithographs of Towns and Cities in the United States, maps that look like this map that you see in the front. Uh, maybe you've seen maps like these. They were very common in the middle of the 19th century up through the end of the 19th century and into the early parts of the 20th century. They were overviews of landscapes, principally of cities. This book, uh, a study of early photograph albums. This is an example of one of them. This is the way those early photographs albums look like. Uh, here was the photograph taken, and it was uh, mounted on a card and inserted through this slot that you see at the bottom of the album page, and then displayed on any number of pages. This work was written just a couple of years ago by a Yale professor named Elizabeth Siegel. This book by Luc Sante, a contemporary writer who was interested in folk photography, or what are called real photo postcards, literal images uh, taken with the camera, pr um, uh, printed right on to the postcard itself. And mm, very importantly, this book titled Walker Evans and the Picture Postcard, a catalog that was drawn from uh, a exhibit that was shown a couple of years ago at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Walker Evans, some of you may know, is a great 20th century photographer whose pictures graced uh, the uh, text of James Agee's Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. These are some of the most iconic images of the country that this man had produced during that period. And this is a man who had a huge collection of picture postcards that numbered in the thousands that were eventually donated to the Modern Museum of Art. This book, uh, finally a huge compendium of postcards about New York collected by Andrus Adam. And in particular, this 
essay by Kent Lidecker, a uh, wonderful overview of the golden age of postcards. Well, anyway, I make mention of these things because I want you to have some sense of the intellectual bloodlines that I have drawn upon to allow me to talk to you today. But in addition to this, for you folks, I thought it would be interesting to see an example of a media that doesn't get a lot of attention. All of that stuff that I have given you is a visual bibliography that draws from what we now call the covers of the books. But for those of us who are older, we sometimes call those covers dust jackets or wrappers. And their original function in the technology of a book was to protect the book from the elements. This was the thing that was going to ensure that the pages were crisp and clean, but that technology has been adapted in a present age for a totally different purpose, to promote the book, to give you a visual image that allows us to say, uh, you can read a book by its cover. And many of us do, in fact, do that. In fact, maybe some of the students in this very room and maybe some of the, the faculty members who are assigning those texts that uh, our students are skimming through. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the um, moments where I want to stop and talk about how it is that I came by this photograph, um, these postcards and why uh, they are of importance to me and the work that I have been doing. For five years or more, I have been intensely interested in a period of American theater and performance known as blackface minstrelsy that flourished in the years leading up to the Civil War, through the Civil War, and the period following the Civil War for perhaps several decades. And uh, in an effort to understand more about that period of theatrical history, much of which uh, we have wanted to disavow for many good reasons, I had wanted to better understand who these people were that were participating in the blackface performances and what it was that motivated them. As a consequence of that work, I began looking for information about these individuals, the lives that they lived, and the families that they were part of, and the areas of the country that they came from. In the course of that effort, a man named Scott Waldy, who I have to thank for providing me the cards that I, I am going to show you today, uh, I had access to some of that story that I was looking for. These cards belong to a, uh, a woman who was a child of uh, a brother to one of the blackface performers. And I was initially looking for information that would have helped me to better understand the blackface performers, but became mesmerized by the cards themselves and what they told me about the lives of these people that lived, in this case, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Uh, before I, I speak for a moment about this card, if I can, let me uh, be sure that everyone understands where it is that I'm talking about, and I hope that I can get this up quickly. Um, this is a picture uh, given to us by way of Google that shows you on this map where the city is located just outside of Providence, Rhode Island, uh, at the head of the Blackstone River, which, as I said, runs all the way up to Worcester. More about the Blackstone in just a minute. And the cards uh, were sent between two sisters who lived in this community growing up in Pawtucket, not far from here, maybe four hours' drive, and who later became separated in life when one of them moved to another part of uh, 
that nearby coastline. And if I can quickly figure out how to do this, I can show you yet another map, in this case, of an island located just off the edge of the map here, Nantucket Island. And because the connection is so slow, I don't know if this is going to happen very quickly. But in any event, one of the sisters winds up on Nantucket. The other, uh, a stay-at-home, lives in Pawtucket. And the sister in Pawtucket named Emma spends a lot of time writing postcards to her younger sister describing life back home. Uh, at some point in the exchange of cards, it became clear that the sister who lives on Nantucket was very interested in collecting some of these cards, but not necessarily the ones that were being sent to her by her sister in Pawtucket. Instead, she was interested in a different kind of card. Uh, let's close the current tab. She was interested instead in cards that had images of lighthouses on them. And this is why we're taking a look at this very first one of, uh, whoops, I seem to be jumping back and forth here. Well, we can close that out. Here we go. Uh, this first one of one of the lighthouses in Maine that represented her great focus in collecting these cards. Let's move from north to south, if we could, um, quickly. This is Portland, Maine. This is the headlight at the uh, edge of the Casco Bay, which you see in the background. And this next card is of an inland lake uh, in New Hampshire where uh, a lighthouse was built in Lake Senapee. This is one of the most photographed lighthouses in all of New England. This is Nubble Light in York Beach, southern Maine. Uh, as you look at these cards, I think you're getting a sense of how beautiful some of these images are, and I suspect this was at least part of her motivation. But remember, she lives on an island, and there are lighthouses on Nantucket, and this is part of her real life that this woman is living. Here's another image of Noble Light and contemporary uh, visitors to the shoreline right near the lighthouse. Moving south, these are a pair of lights in Gloucester, Massachusetts, the twin lights on Thatcher's Island. Another image uh, from Gloucester, Anisquam Light. Uh, this remarkable image of Minot Light in Boston Harbor in the moonlight. And you can see the searchlights turning in both directions. This image, uh, again from Boston, uh, the Boston Light. There are several images from the harbor. This is Graves Light, just off of Boston Harbor. And this image of Deer Island Light. Moving further south to the Narragansett Bay, this image of the Conomicut Light in the head of the harbor. This, another night image of Goat Island Light in Newport, Rhode Island. You can see in the background a steamer. And perhaps uh, one of the more startling images of a light on an island off of Rhode Island, Block uh, Island, very much like the landscape where Jenny Cotton, Emma's sister, lives on Nantucket. This is another instance of one of those real postcards. And finally, uh, further south on the Connecticut coastline, this lighthouse in New London, the New London Light. This is maybe the card that moved Jenny the most. 
This is an image of, as you can see, written on the left-hand side of the card, Lime Rock Light in Newport, Rhode Island, showing Ida Lewis, the only woman lighthouse keeper in the world, heroine of many brave rescues. There's Ida, and there is her poodle at her feet. Uh, she worked on that island for a long time. Go ahead, James. Yeah, question about it. Yeah, no question. Uh, and uh, as was clear from the information on the card, a real heroine to a lot of women for her unusual occupation and groundbreaking life as uh, a female in a business that was almost exclusively reserved for men. Shortly after this card was sent to Jenny, uh, in 1911 by her niece, Rhoda, whose name you see written here, uh, there was this article in the newspaper printed that states Ida Lewis, keeper of Lime Rock Light in Newport Harbor for more than a half century, died Tuesday night following a stroke of apoplexy. Uh, for those of you that have a medical back background, maybe you can tell me what apoplexy is, but I think it was a catch-all term for heart attacks and uh, violent sneezes and a lot of other strange things that they couldn't explain at the time. Whatever it may have been, she died of it, and it was in the newspaper, and guess what? It was so important to Jenny that she cut it out of the paper and pasted it onto the back of this card because she wanted a historical record of the passing of this very famous figure, Ida uh, Lewis. This is where Jenny's interest lay initially in collecting postcards. And she would ask her friends and family to send them images of the lighthouses along the coast or elsewhere in the United States that lighthouses were used for navigation. However, in addition to this, she was receiving a lot of cards from other folks that were talking about other kinds of things, not uh, lighthouses, but everyday things that she also had an interest in. And some of those cards, too, got collected for other reasons altogether, principally because they were cards that her sister, Emma Cotton Blake, uh, or Emma's daughter, Rhoda, her niece, Jenny's niece, had sent. And they hint at a story. And just as the visual bibliography that I showed you a few minutes ago hints at a story that I'm trying to tell here about the uh, theories that have been used to explain the way these cards have been used and what they mean. So too does uh, the set of cards that we're about to look at hint at a story that speaks to the way in which Jenny was trying to create meaning with these cards and her sister was trying to create meaning with these cards and the nation was trying to create meaning with these cards. When I first saw these cards, I had a very difficult time sorting them out. And I spent hours arranging them by manufacturer, by topics. I arranged them by addresses on the card. I arranged them by stamps, by postmarks. I arranged them by themes. Every piece of information that I could possibly use off of those cards became a classification tool that I put at my disposal with better or worse results, depending upon how much coffee I had drank that day, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> let me explain uh, what these cards are about. This was the very earliest of the cards that she collected. It shows an image of a place called Rocky Point, which was an amusement park in Rhode Island near Providence. You can see here, for example, the Ferris wheel and a kind of boardwalk where there were patrons that got to watch bathers. You can see the bathing costumes that people wore at that particular time were pretty full length. 
not like what you see outside of my door where I live at Rockaway Beach in the middle of the summer. Uh, and you can see that this card is signed by Sister Emma, Jenny's sister. This is the back of the card, and if you'll uh, look carefully here, there's not a lot of information at first glance. It was written in 1906, we know that from the postmark up here. In those days, when you sent a card, the post office would indicate with this postal stamp that the card had been sent at such and such a time. But if you look down here carefully, you can also see that uh, there was another procedure that took place in the post office that indicated when the card uh, went from Pawtucket on the 6th, I'm sorry, on uh, the 15th of May, and no, let's see, this is the 3rd of October, I beg your pardon, it was sent on the 3rd of October at 5.15, is that right? That must have been what it meant. And it arrived the next day in Nantucket, in that uh, distant island, at 4 p.m. It only took an hour, and there was a postal stamp that indicated here, it's upside down, that it had got there at that location, at that time. So we know how long it took for the, the card to arrive here. The card uh, cost a penny to send. The card probably cost a penny to buy. and. It is, in collector's language, an example of an undivided back, which is to say that there is no line down the middle of the card where you put your message over here and you put your address over here. This stuff hadn't been invented at that particular point in time. The post office didn't know how to do this. What would be the most useful way to send a card and permit somebody to put information on there. And for that reason, the manufacturer of the card wrote down at the bottom, this side is for the address only. You can only put the address on this side of the card. You're not to fool around. If you put something else on there, we're not going to send it. Uh, you can only put the address on this side. Well, this is 1906. In 1907, everything changes. The divided back appears, and the technology of a card is transformed. Now you're freed up to write all you want in this little space. You don't have just the bottom line on the front of the card to work with. And the image on the face of the card can be expanded to cover the whole face of the card. Thus begins the golden age of postcards. and. Now it's time to give you a little background about the social history, one of those key three terms that I was interested in in the beginning. And for our purposes, this story starts here in Pawtucket with this mill, this cotton mill that is still standing and a historic site that probably represents, if not the first cotton mill in the United States, one of the first cotton mills. It was another one that was built in Beverly, Massachusetts. And here begins the Industrial Revolution. We are here in this room with all of this technology only because of this process that starts at this place. This is the jump start of the Industrial Revolution. It is uh, called Slater's Mill because it was built by a man named Sl uh, Sam Slater who uh, stole all of the technologies that you, he used to build this cotton mill from England at the behest of Moses Brown, a wealthy slave trader in Providence, the founder of Brown University. And with that money begins an effort to jumpstart the revolution in textile manufacturing in the United States. All of the cotton that's produced in the southern states ends up being shipped into the north to places like Pawtucket where manufacturing of that raw material can produce cotton shirts, cotton pants, cotton jackets, and all the rest of those things 
that we're wearing today here in this room. This is the beginning of the story, and the beginning of the story about the cards lies with uh, this man, whose name is Charles Nelson Cotton. Ironically, he has the same last name as the raw material that will transform the city of Pawtucket. And he was born in uh, 1827, I think. Uh, I'm sorry, 1837. And this is a very early photograph of him as a young man, probably taken in the early 1850s. This is a picture of his wife, Mary Emma Cotton. And the two of them would be married for a very short time during the 1850s while in their uh, early 20s, and in her case, uh, late teens, before having two children, Emma, uh, their first daughter, and Jenny, their second daughter, and uh, only five years before the Civil War will break out in 1861. The Civil War will transform the country, transform the city, transform this family, and lie at the heart of much of what we have lived with in the aftermath. It is true that uh, sometimes genealogical information looks a little more understandable when laid out in family trees, and here is that relationship spelled out for you. Charles and Mary have produced two children, one born in 1856, Emma, and Jenny, just three years before the war. Rhoda was Emma's only child, Jenny's niece. Oni was Jenny's only child, Emma's nephew. Most of the correspondence is about these people. All of these cards are either describing these folks, sent by these folks, about these folks. More about the cards and how to read the cards uh, and the history. In addition to uh, early records of the family, letters that they have sent, were these photographs of some of the family, uh, brothers and uh, siblings of Mary Emma who served in the Civil War. This is one of those individuals. Here is his haunting face in close-up. Here is an image of Hiram Cotton, Charles Nelson's brother, in his uniform, his haunting face. And here is, in fact, an image of Charles Nelson Cotton and his own signed card and his haunting face, perhaps. In the family album is also a daguerreotype of Abraham Lincoln, a man whose image you have seen in this very same form on the back or front of some of the money that you've got in your pocket. <clears throat> uh, after the war, it is clear that there are a number of people that uh, have faced a different kind of life as a consequence of their experience. And pictured here in a painting by Charles Eastman Johnson is an image of one of those family that uh, have been transformed by what happened during the conflict. This picture, is, this painting was titled The Pension Agent, and here you see the pension agent illuminated he is a government official who travels around throughout the country talking to disabled volunteers, as they were called, about their injuries and trying to determine if, in fact, they are eligible for government assistance or a pension. This is probably this veteran's wife to the right, uh, who is peeling the apple. And to the left in the picture are probably either her father and mother, or perhaps this volunteer's father and mother, and they have that anxious look of expectation that asks, what's going to happen? Will he give us the pension? 
This was an issue that uh, arose for many of these people that served in the war, but not for all of them. Hiram, for example, who you saw in one of those images, he never returned from the war. He was killed in the war. His wife received some small pension, not him. Uh, and this was an issue that would arise later in the Cotton family, but we'll get to that story in just a minute. Again, back to the cards. Uh, to better understand uh, how it is that these cards became so important to Jenny, you need to know what it was like when she moved to Nantucket, a remote island off of the coast of Massachusetts. This was a picture taken of her on her first trip to the island in uh, 1880. It was an agricultural place, not the kind of place that you might associate uh, with the rich people that live there now. You can see that some of that is hinted at in so much as the ox in this uh, photograph gets top billing. He fits in the picture. The rest of these people are kind of an afterthought. What's important here is the ox and the cart. But if we look at a closer up version, even if it's grainy of the photograph, we can see the ladies on the cart. And this is probably an image of Jenny Cotton, although it's not absolutely certain, with the whip in her hand. She uh, met a family on a smaller island off of Nantucket named Dunham. And this was one of their beach houses where they stored equipment for their boat that they used to go back and forth from this tiny little island to the larger island of Nantucket. And here is the patriarch James Dunham's uh, uh, following and family. And this is his son, Albert, and he will eventually end up marrying Jenny. He's about 18 in this picture. You can see he doesn't even have shoes. Uh, this is a rural life of fishermen. It is also the case that although there is a town in the center of the island, Nantucket, uh, things are not uh, as they were perhaps 50 years earlier when the whaling industry was at its height. For those of you who are literary fans, you know that Moby Dick begins on Nantucket. Melville sets off Ishmael and Queequeg and all the rest of the uh, uh, crew from this island. And there are people taking photographs here, and I put this up to show you a glimpse of what the town of Nantucket looked like, but also more importantly to show you that once the photographs were taken to better understand the cards, you can see how they were transformed with lithography. The photographs that uh, you see underneath these lithographs are black and whites that are then colored through the lithographic process to create these beautiful hues that you saw when looking at the lighthouses or some of those other uh, uh, some of the cards that you're going to see in just a minute. It's a, it's a tedious process, coloring and creating these kinds of images. I wanted to show you this one to show you uh, where it worked really well as long as the guys were willing to do it, but at a certain point when they got to the street scene, they said, let's call it a day. Uh, we've had it, no more time to put colors on this picture, who cares anyway? Uh, this is an image of Concord, New Hampshire as part of the collection. Here's a, a rare example, and there are not a lot of examples of what the photographs look like before they're transformed. This is a photograph taken in uh, the nearby Catskills. This is the Otis Elevating Railroad. This is a railroad that goes up an impossibly steep incline. And as a consequence of this unusual railroad, there were a great number of tourists that came to this location and a photograph used as a lantern slide, which is why these things are created in this rounded way, uh, was made 
to allow for a positive image to be placed on a sheet of glass and then uh, mounted in a lantern and with the light behind it projected onto a screen not unlike what we're looking at now. Here's the transformed version uh, when the postcard makers get a hold of it. It is uh, the same image, but a little different. They crop the picture. Here is uh, the section that they were interested in to emphasize the vanishing point at a uh, uh, distance from the man standing here. But clearly, no doubt, these are the same two images. Let's look at them really carefully to understand what these guys were doing when they made the cards. Here's a detail, if you look at the key up at the top, of this photograph. And you can see there's a lot of detail. Now we know uh, that this man was wearing a vest. We can almost read the information on this box at his side. Here's a uh, detailed image of the upper half of the photograph. Here's the train coming down the tracks. OK, now take a look at a close-up of information at the left-hand side of the page of the photograph, not that distinguished, and a close-up of the train coming down the tracks. Uh, pretty clear that there's a train there and some kind of weird uh, element on the tracks, but not a whole lot of other information. OK, postcard, close-up of those same locations. This was the section at the upper left, but suddenly, look, there's something up there on the ridge that's appeared. Uh, and it's outlined, right? Here's the original side by side. You can barely make out that something up there. But now it's really clear in the postcards that there's a hotel up there. You can see it. It's been outlined. This is an early version of Photoshop at work here. <laughs> Uh, and again, uh, look at this image of the train coming down the tracks. You can still see the train, but look, the tracks are really clearly outlined here. Uh, they're not visible at all in the original. You can't see the tracks, but in this transformed version, they're real clear. What's going on? Why are people doing things like that? They're trying to draw your attention to what they believe are some of the key elements of this scene. They're trying to, in effect, create caricatures that uh, abstract the important pieces of information that they want you to see. And this process informs much of the cards, many of the cards that you're about to take a look at as we move forward here. There's also another process that I think uh, speaks to why the cards look the way they do. This is one of those views that I talked about earlier when we were looking through the bibliography. This is what those maps look like. This was a view of Pawtucket in 1877. If you were up in space, this is what it would look like uh, from a great distance. Here's a couple of the bridges that cross the Pawtucket River that eventually becomes the Blackstone. Here's a train off in the distance. Here are all of the uh, buildings in the community. Look at close-ups of this map. Here's the downtown area. This is how detailed this information, these views were. If you can see, even from the back of the room, you can spot individual people walking in the street and their shadows being cast on the sidewalks and the pavement. Here, here, here. You can even see up on the top a horse-drawn trolley being dragged on tracks. This is how detailed these views were. Not photographs, hand-drawn maps of what the community looked like. And here yet, I'm sorry, uh, here yet is another Another view of one of the details in this map, the bridges, the falls, uh, and the smokestacks that represent the burgeoning industry that has sprung up from Slater's first mill. 
At the bottom of the map was a key. If I go backwards one slide, you can see there's a number seven here. And if you go to the key on the map, you can see that you can determine from the key that located at number seven was the Paw Tucket Hair Cloth Company. I do not know what hair cloth is, <laughs> but I don't want to wear one of those shirts, I don't think. <laughs> Uh, look at some of the other industries that were part and parcel of life in Pawtucket 50 years after the development of the first cotton mill in this community. These are people that are in the business of, among other things, uh, producing hair cloth, but also padding, also wadding, machines, uh, file companies, people who manufacture cotton machinery and malleable iron castings, bolts and coach screws. They make hand and bench screws, clamps, tool chests, and croquet games in this place. Uh, look at this unbelievable array of things that were taking place in this community. You could find there steam fire engines being manufactured, steam fire pumps, machinery, uh, builders of improved spoolers, patent leather belting, patent lace leather. You could find tanned belting. You could find people who dealt in cotton waste, paper stock. You could find manufacturers of braiding. You could find box manufacturers, carpenters, people who dealt in lumber, coal, brick, lime, cement, people who dyed thread, bleached thread, printed thread, manufactured knitting yarn, print cloths, and so on. In fact, uh, if you weren't feeling well, be assured you would be taken care of in the afterlife with silver-plated coffin trimmings. Uh, this is a place that spun off a lot of industry, a wide variety of things. This is the effect of industrialism as of 1877. This is a bird's eye view. You've heard that word already of Pawtucket. And in many respects, the manufacturer of the card and the selection of this particular photograph emulates the views of just a short period before when maps were made that boasted of uh, exalted views of the community. Here is another instance of a bird's eye view, one that I think has a composition worthy of a real skilled artist. Here is uh, a shot of the river and the manufacturing beyond and a really wonderful sense of asymmetrical balance in the card. Emma is sending most of these cards to Jenny, telling her, guess what? Town has changed since you left here in the 1880s. While you've been out in the sticks on uh, Tuckanock and Nantucket, life has transformed itself in our community. We have, for example, a brand new bank, and here's the building that houses that bank. Uh, it is a unbelievable uh, new addition to our community. And look in this photograph, you can see even the arrival of the automobile next to the horse and carriage. Life is changing for these folks that live in Pawtucket. And it is also an opportunity for Emma to write to her nephew and offer advice. Here we find out that the apprentice that her husband had hired in the blacksmithing business accidentally shot himself last Sunday. And the advice is, Oni, you young man, do not fool with firearms. Good advice. Uh, here's another overview of town. Emma enters these cards. She's labeling them with her information about where each of these streets is located or what buildings are located where so that uh, Jenny can get her bearings in this new community. You can see they have a trolley 
And on the back of this card, Emma writes to Oni saying, do you know where these buildings are? They're located at the corner, whoops, I jumped the wrong way. They're located at the corner of Broad and I've forgotten the other name, Main Street. And uh, this is where you can find yourself by locating the word butter on that sign. Uh, here is an image of one of their local parks and she has even put an X on this cast iron umbrella. And she writes on the opposite side of the card, uh, Dear Jenny, I think Father, who is now living with Jenny on Nantucket, painted the umbrella in the picture once. And he will remember, he said it was a warm day. Here's a park building donated by Samuel Slater's relatives who have done well in the community manufacturing cotton. And she tells her sister, I thought you'd like to see one of these views. Here's another one of the parks, uh, Jenks Park. Uh, Jenks was a manufacturer of steam engines. There are views of the riverscape that Emma sends to her sister. The iconic images of the great bridges in the community. This one, the Division Street Bridge. This, a view from the Exchange Street Bridge. This, a real postcard of the Division State, uh, Street Bridge in the background and of some of the uh, boats anchored just below the bridge. Here are the Central Falls the Main Street Bridge, an iconic image for the community for years. Ever since the manufacture of uh, the establishment of Slater's first mill, so important that even local photographers in the 1870s, when patrons would come to their studio, would have a painted backdrop of that falls in the background. Here is a close-up of that falls. But with industrialism comes all of the horrors of industrialism. And after the war, uh, eventually with the new labor market, cheap labor market that opens up in the South, when all of the slaves have been freed, much of this textile business disappears and winds up in other parts of the country and no longer supporting the folks who live in Pawtucket. And if you don't believe me how unhappy a place this might have been to live, in spite of all the claims of great progress, take a look at this terrific image of what would be a class action suit, a one of many railroad stations that appear in the collection of cards. This one in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Uh, there is news on the back of one of these cards from Emma that not only is it hot here, but we had a bad storm on Saturday and it burnt out a fuse in our telephone. These folks now have telephones for the first time in their lives. I was somewhat frightened. I think I must be getting nervous. Uh, these are folks that didn't necessarily understand how telephones worked. Lots of images of post offices, uh, which were a big innovation in the way in which their messaging systems could be sped from a city like Pawtucket to a rural area like Nantucket in the course of a single day. Even news of a new hospital being built in Pawtucket. Uh, and she passes on that news to her sister and the exact location of that hospital. A new school being built. A new boys club being built. A new fire engine station being built. Here's a piece of advice for any young person. Uh, Emma writes to Oni, did I understand you've got another get, uh, good job? Well, uh, get a good job and stay. That's the way to get rich. Uh, good advice. City Hall. City Hall. And uh, images of the Masonic building. And word from... Emma to her nephew that I was pleased to get your card 
and wanted to assure you that you better not let Grandpa go to the home alone because I think it's better for all to let him go. Uh, that's where he made his home, but as I said, don't let him go alone. What is she talking about? Uh, this is a rural area where Charles Nelson Cotton has lived with his daughter. Uh, his wife has died many years before at the age of 48. He's now 80 years old. He wants to go back to the place where he spent a few years earlier. This location in Togus, uh, uh, Maine, the eastern branch of the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers who are housed here in a facility established by Abraham Lincoln in 1865. This is a postcard sent from Togus. This shows the men, the volunteers, the veterans of the Civil War living at that location. During all of those years after the Civil War, as many as 2,000 men lived at this site. They wore uniforms. You see these men in uniforms. And the facility was run much like a camp. And you gave up your pension if you were disabled when you went to this home. And in exchange, you got room and board. This was another image. Uh, these are very lonely pictures, in my mind, of isolated individuals walking around a little lost. This card was sent by one of Jenny's aunts who wrote this very long note on a postcard. It said, uh, your uncle John Cole passed away this month and his two kids, Fanny and Grace, went to Togus. The funeral was held there. He was sick for a short time. The chaplain wrote uh, John Cole's daughter a very good letter saying that he'd made his peace with God before he went and she wanted him, uh, he wanted the chaplain to write just the words that he sent to his two daughters. Fanny said the funeral service was impressive and she thought it was best to have him buried there. Here's the kicker, he died three days before his pension was due, $92, $92. But here's the deal, they cannot have it as he was dead. I wish Florence could have had it, one of his children, but that's their rule. I think your dad, Charlie, will recognize this picture. Yes, he would, because he lived there. The folks in Pawtucket made some trips to New York, and I would not permit myself to stand in front of you without showing you what this place looked like a while back. This is an image of Manhattan Beach, I'm sorry, Brighton Beach, near, uh, on Coney Island. Uh, and Emma writes to her sister, boy, this is terrific. This is one of the hotels they stayed at in Brooklyn, not far from your house, uh, Carly, is my guess. Uh, neighborhoods changed a little bit. Rhoda, uh, Emma's daughter, is staying there, and she writes to her cousin, Oni, Auntie's having a great time. Did I tell you I saw an airship go up last Sunday? It was great. Not an airplane, an airship because no one has seen an airplane before. No one has learned that piece of technology and how to name it. It is a liken to the only thing they know that allows you to get around. It is an airship. It was great to see this. They take a steamship, the Robert Fulton, up the Hudson. And Emma writes back to her sister, on the way up the Hudson, this boat is just lovely. They go to Wall Street. Uh, they have an opportunity to do the thing that they've really wanted to do. They've seen the mail order catalogs. They go to Wanamaker's, the precursor to Macy's. Uh, before it was Macy's, John Wanamaker uh, ran this department store. And here is the theater, the drama of shopping, all laid out for the participants. Here is an image of the new Manhattan Bridge. 
Uh, I've tried to get you some Lighthouse cards, but so far no success. To be honest with you, I'm not interested in Lighthouse cards as a subtext. I'm having too good a time at places like this, Luna Park, uh, on Coney Island. If you've never seen an image of what Coney Island looked like 100 years ago, this was it. Here's her description. Dear sister, received your card and I was very glad to get it. All of the dots that you see in the, light, in the postcard are lights. In the evening, it's beautiful. I went last night. It's about 10 miles from here. I'm having a dandy time. Just in case you didn't realize it, uh, all of those dots are lights here. If you've never seen them before, uh, you might need an explanation. Uh, here is the Brooklyn Bridge, not uh, completed long before this. And here is the news. I came over this bridge yesterday with FNB. This is her husband in a taxi. It cost us $3.10 from the boat. We had a great time, and we thought of you often. Here's a view from up on one of the piers on the Brooklyn Bridge looking at the new city. This is the Woolworth Building over here near City Hall, and this is City Hall, this larger building on the horizon. Uh, still standing, both of those structures. Okay, uh, here's a couple of really marvelous cards that I want to talk about just for a minute. Take a look at these views. At that point in time, there was one thing in the city that was transforming life here. It was the Underground Railroad and nobody knew much about it unless you'd been here, and it was kind of hard to imagine a railroad going underground through these cast iron tubes, and so it was really useful to, for example, show what it might look like if you had an ant farm kind of cutaway view of the boats sailing up above the water, uh, the subterranean level, and these underground railroads moving underneath the river, just as this view shows you the same thing. One of the reasons why I wanted to be sure to show you these images is because you're looking at the explosion of technology as a consequence of the industrialism that we've watched flower from locations like Pawtucket. But we all know there's a price to pay for these things, not only in poor air quality, but in a lot of often exploited people. And not long after these cards were sent, the country was plunged in a depression, and a Mexican painter named Diego Rivera came here to this country and was commissioned by one of the wealthiest members of New York society to put some murals up in uh, the Rockefeller Center, and at that time, Diego Rivera painted this painting titled Frozen Assets, showing a similar kind of cutout of the layers of the city. Here is that stupendous skyline that we've already got a glimpse of. Underneath uh, uh, the vault where all of the money is kept that has built this edifice, this is likened to an image of John D. Rockefeller. Here are the people waiting to look at their money. Here is a guard overseeing this vault behind him. In this image, he is turned around on a layer above. Here are rows and rows of homeless people sleeping in a warehouse-style facility that actually existed on one of the piers. Here are people waiting on all of the subway platforms to go to work that will allow for the building, as you see, the cranes of this magnificent edifice. And this, this is now on exhibit right now at the Modern Museum of Art. Uh, in the rural areas, it's a different world. Rhoda marries a family who lives in Hooksett, New Hampshire. Their claim to fame is a rock outcropping with an observatory up on top. But no matter how high they claim, they can't climb, they can't see this kind of stuff, but they've heard about it, just as people in Nantucket had. And this is the way they envisioned their community in the future. This is one of their general stores in Hooksett. And here is an ent entry to the subway to New York. 
Here is a new trolley. Here are some flying machines up above that are going to be part of the world of the future. Uh, you might not be able to recognize them. I can't because I've never seen flying machines that look like those bugs up there. Now here is a train that isn't even supported by any kind of trestle. Uh, this is a world that seems unbelievable to these folks and was unbelievable to Charles Nelson who would die in 1914 in his early 80s. And uh, here is the last picture that, uh, nearly the last one I want to show you, of Jenny living on Nantucket uh, in uh, her late ages in uh, 1943, the year that she would die in the midst of World War II. That's the end of their story, but not the end of the things that I'm really interested in. Do you remember this picture that I showed you uh, earlier as an example of how the photographs were colored? This picture is a picture of my grandfather as a young child, and he has an incredible story to tell uh, about his life for a year with the Shakers when his mother could not afford to keep him and gave him away to this religious sect. And I have not had a chance to tell the story of Charles Nelson's relationship to his brother, Ben Cotton, who was that blackface minstrel who precipitated this whole excursion into the postcards that I've had a chance now to show you. On that note, to be continued. Thank you very much. Sure. <clears throat>